But uh, he has ingrained it so much into my head that every time somebody says, that being said, like the phrase, that being said, I always finish it by, in my head by saying, are you ready to study the word of God, yes or no? I don't know if you guys do that, but it's just me. It's just me. I'm a little weird. That's okay. All right. So just by a raise of hands, who likes road trips? Yeah. Oh, wow. A lot of people. I honestly, I can't stand road trips because I just feel stuck. I don't really like being in the car. Okay. And, and here's why. So, well, first of all, here, how many people like construction or detours or wrong turns or having to turn around? No? Okay. I didn't, I didn't expect, or I, I did expect that you wouldn't like that. Here's why I hate road trips. So every summer, my family would go from either Michigan to Florida or from Indiana to Florida because we moved later, and then we started going from Indiana to Florida. And we would drive the whole way. And boy, was it a long, long drive. Well, one specific summer, I ended up getting sick on the drive. And it wasn't the type of sick, you know what I'm about to say, it wasn't the type of sick where you can just lean out and then be good. It's the type of sick where I need to find a bathroom like that or it's going to be bad for everybody else in the car. Real bad, okay? Don't want to be too graphic. But that's just, that's how it was, okay? I'm just being real. So about every 30 minutes to an hour, we would have to stop and find a gas station because I was sick. And I felt so bad for everybody else in the car because I was making them sp spend more time on the road and less time at their destination. I was make cutting into their vacation because of my sickness, all right? As a, as a kid, I would be the one to ask the question, are we there yet? Anybody have those kids in their lives to ask the question, are we there yet? That was me, all right? So my parents started deciding to telling me a time that we were supposed to arrive to our destination. And I wouldn't be lying if I thought that maybe they fudged the numbers a little bit. So we were actually supposed to arrive at 5.30. Maybe they said 7.30. So then they wouldn't have to have that question asked in the car. Well, sometimes we would make slower time than normal. So I would be upset if we weren't to our destination when we were supposed to be. Because I was one that hated the journey. I was one that wanted to be at the destination. We would go to Florida because that's where my grandparents currently live. And I just wanted to be with my grandma and grandpa. Is that too much to ask? <laughs> I hated the journey. Hated the journey. Never enjoyed the trip. It felt like we were wandering. It felt like we were on a very long stroll. It felt like we were never going to get there. And this is just a little bit like the Israelites when they were wandering for 40 years. Now, the Israelites probably felt like they were stuck in construction for 40 years. Probably felt like they were taking wrong turns for 40 years. Were taking detours for 40 years. Unbearable. But they did it to themselves, and I'll explain why in a little bit. So over Memorial Day weekend... I took a trip to, and it was, it was only about nine hours, so it wasn't terrible, a, tr a trip in the car. Took a trip with my wife, with my son Archie, and a few of my wife's family members to her uncle's cabin in Missouri. And this cabin, although very great, was just out in the middle of the boonies. So you have one spot where you get one bar of LTE, and that's it. Move a little bit this way, no service. Move a little bit this way, no service. One spot. And so this cabin was right next to a river. And if you guys want to throw that picture up right now. This cabin was right next to a river. And it's very, very pretty. Really pretty. I actually, I took that picture because I thought it was so beautiful. Well, if you look to the left there, there's a, a river bank. And it's filled with river rock. And so, like anybody would want to do, you find a body of water, you find rocks, then you try to find the, the flattest, the, the most well-rounded rock to skip, right? So I find that rock, pick it up, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to skip this thing like 15 times. Get it over to the other side, and I'm going to feel really good about myself. Why does that make us feel good? I don't know, but I wanted to do it. So I picked it up, got really low, really close to the water, and 
flung it straight into the water. No skips at all. No skips at all. So I looked down. All right. It's the first throw of the season. Don't worry about it, Evan. Just pick up another rock. So I pick up another rock. Look at it. It's not as good as the first one, but it'll do, you know? So I, I pick it up, and I throw it. One skip right into the water. Just terrible. If there was a world champion's rock skipper right next to me, they would probably berate me. They, it was just so bad. And so I find this rock right here. I'm like, man, this is a good rock. See that? It's got like a little notch right there where you can put your finger and really get the torque, get as many skips as you want, you know? And the, the previous two throws from me were so bad, I was going to spare this rock from being thrown into the water without any good skips. So I just took it. But then I got to thinking, why does this rock look like this? Why does it look like this? Why is it so flat? And why is it so round? And there's no like jagged edges. So I did a little digging so that you guys wouldn't have to. Because I know that you have more time than to just look up why river rocks are to be the way they are. It starts from erosion. A rock like this breaks off from another big piece of rock, enters the river, and then when the river, t the fast current takes this rock and hits it al along the other rocks, the points, the jagged edges, they start to break off. And over the course, course of time, rock starts to look like this. A lot of time was spent in the river with this rock. You can tell because it's very flat. It's very well-rounded. There's no jagged edges. A lot of time is spent in the river. You know, and this is kind of like our faith journey. Just like these rocks, they hit bumps. They get what we call transport-induced abrasions. That's when you go down, the rock goes down the river and hits other rocks and pieces start breaking off. So just like our faith journey, we hit bumps. We have transport-induced abrasions. We end up on the bank of the river, but we inevitably reach our destination. Now, the rock is at the will of the river. The rock is, in essence, surrendering to the will of the river. And the rock is shaping, or the river is shaping the rock with each hit, with each abrasion, with each stop. But the rock still ends up in its destination. So compare this to our faith journey, or another way to describe it is our relationship with Jesus. Compare this to that. We have little bumps. We have abrasions. We take little detours and end up on the bank of the river, but we inevitably reach our destination. However, many of us don't take time to enjoy the journey down the river. They were you, some, some people are just like me as a little kid, sometimes like me now. You're not taking time to enjoy the journey. And the journey is about surrender. It's about surrendering to the will of God in order to let him shape us instead of fighting it. You know, most of us end up wandering more than we end up worshiping. You see, because we're all wanderers. We're all on the journey to becoming a worshiper. But the journey is long. And it requires submission. It requires surrender. You see, I'm a wanderer too, just like everybody else here. And one way that I am more like a wanderer than like a worshiper is through expectation. How many of you guys, like expectation is a huge thing for you, and I'll explain it just a little bit. Like, I expect this event to go like this. I expect this person to act like this. But when they don't, ugh, I get angry. Nobody? A couple of you? Yeah. Hands again. All right. So that's me. If an event doesn't go the right way, if a person doesn't act the right way that I am expecting them to act, frustration and irritation set in. And sometimes I'm frustrated. Sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I don't look like a pastor, yet alone even a Christian. Sometimes the jagged edges in my life stick out more than they should. You see, some of us do look like this rock right here. Not a lot of time in the river. Not a lot of time uh, surrendering to the will of God. 
Very jagged, a lot of, a lot of harsh edges. Some of us look like this. Kind of, you know, a little, little less jagged. Pretty flat, you know? Like, I could take this and probably skip it once, right? A little bit more time spent in the river and a little bit more time spent surrendering to the will of God. Some of us look like this. Pretty smooth all the way around, yet not flat yet, right? A lot more time spent in the river, a lot more time spent surrendering to the will of God. Some of us look like this. A lot of time spent in the river, a lot of time spent surrendering to the will of God. This rock can be skipped a long way if you're good at it. Not me though. But here's, here's the point. Each one of these rocks represents a person in the journey. And this rock isn't better than this rock. This rock isn't better than this rock. That's what I want to tell you guys. You are a part of your own journey to becoming a person surrendering to the will of God, to becoming a worshiper. So don't look at other journeys and think that one is better than the other because this is your relationship with God. Work on it yourself. Work on your own relationship with God, if you have it. And don't worry about the destination. Enjoy the journey. That's it. I'm, no, I'm kidding. So the journey of becoming a wanderer to becoming a worshiper, it's one of submission. It's a journey of surrender, and it's a journey of being shaped along the way. So let's look at Romans 12.1. It'll be up on the screen there for you guys. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Two words that I want to point out to you guys, living and sacrifice. First word is thuo. That means sacrifice. And I, I think that Paul, the author here, was saying sacrifice in order to capture the attention of the readers so that they could see, okay, we're, hey, we're still kind of required to sacrifice here, but Paul's saying, hey, not in the way that you think. He also throws in zao, which means living. Paul is talking about being a living sacrifice. He's not talking about sacrificing ourselves. Paul is talking about sacrificing anything and everything that gets in the way of you loving God with all you are. Sacrificing anything and everything that gets in the way of you glorifying God. So here's some examples of sacrificing in order to truly worship God. This is on your notes. First one, time. So let's say that we're all mechanics. I am the furthest thing from a mechanic. I can do like brakes, tire change, whatever, but I'm not a mechanic. Let's just pretend for a minute. So we're mechanics. We're really good at changing tires. We, we're driving down the road. We just got off work. And we see a person on the side of the road, hazards blinking. They need a tire change. But... You don't have time for that. You got to get home and eat your dinner and watch your favorite shows and be with the people you love. Sometimes sacrificing time is what it takes to truly worship God. The second one, sleep. This is a big one because a lot of people do not like giving up sleep. New parents, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Sometimes people don't like giving up sleep, but sometimes that's what it takes to truly worship God. Next one, comfort. Nobody likes to be uncomfortable. In fact, when I say comf like being uncomfortable, a lot of people think of the word cringe and you just get, like you just cringe. Nobody likes being uncomfortable. And as Christians, nobody likes being uncomfortable. But here's the funny thing. I think God has a funny sense of humor because most of the time, God calls us to places that are uncomfortable. <laughs> Sometimes comfort is what it takes to sacrifice to truly worship God. Last one, pride. We'll see here in a little bit that worship doesn't make us popular. Worship isn't cute. Worship has never been cute. It's been about surrender and submitting. You see, sacrifice goes hand in hand with worship. Submitting to God everything we need so that we can love him with everything we are. What does submitting or sacrificing look for you? What does it look like? 
what needs to be sacrificed in your life in order to become a better worshiper and not a better wanderer. You know, we've been talking a lot about our illustration of the river rock, but let's turn to some examples in the Bible of worship. First one, it's a woman washing Jesus' feet in Luke 7. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, the, the book of Luke is the third book in the New Testament, and it's one of the four gospels that talk about Jesus' life. So let's go to Luke 7, either in your phone or your Bible if you brought that. Starting from verse 36 and going through 47. Let's read. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. And, and real quick, at some point when we're not focused on Jesus, we have thought things to the person next to us or about people in general that really aren't nice. But can you imagine after thinking that thought, the person then turns to you and says, hey, I read your mind. That wasn't nice. You, I would be creeped out, man. So Simon the Pharisee, immediately, he can tell this man is different. This man could possibly be the son of God that he's been claiming. Let's go on. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash my feet but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. She has shown me much love, but a person who is forgiven little shows only little love. Now, a couple things that I want to hit on. So back then in Jesus' day, when inviting someone over to your house, it's customary to greet them with a kiss, to wash their feet, if not you, your servants, and to anoint their head with olive oil. None of those things happened to Jesus. Simon the Pharisee didn't do any of those things, any of those three, three things. And so right off the bat, we're seeing through the lack of an outward expression, the way that Simon the Pharisee feels about Jesus, the way that he truly feels. But this woman came prepared to anoint Jesus at least with her alabaster jar of perfume. And this, this is where it becomes worship. She knelt down, was weeping so much that she had enough tears, enough liquid to wash Jesus' feet. And there's two reasons why I think that she was crying so hard. Number one, she realized that Jesus was the son of man and that her sins were so many, there was such a huge contrast between her and Jesus, she just broke down. I mean, I've, I've had that feeling too, where I have an encounter with Jesus, I have an encounter with God, and I'm like, oh man, I'm such a sinner, and you start breaking down. Here's the other reason. She saw how much disrespect and how much dishonor was being shown to Jesus by the lack of those three things that didn't happen. And she broke down. I think both of those reasons were the reason for her weeping. So this whole act of worship was very, uh, it was very expensive for her monetarily and her reputation or her pride monetarily because this alabaster jar of perfume 
was said to have cost almost a year's worth of wages. A year's worth. That's crazy. Today, it's said to be equated to $20,000 to $30,000 for, for a bottle of perfume. And yet she gave Jesus so much worth that she poured out the entire bottle on his feet. Not even on his head. That's crazy. That's worship. Not only was it expensive in this way, but also in her reputation. You know, she had comments coming her way. She had thoughts that were bad, that were against her character coming her way. Yet she threw herself to the ground and worshiped Jesus. And lastly, this woman dried Jesus' feet with her hair. And in 1 Corinthians, we see that a woman's hair is the most glorious, the most beautiful part of her body. And here she was drying Jesus' feet with the most beautiful, most glorious part of her body. Let's move on to Noah and the Ark. In Genesis, we read about Noah and the Ark, and it's a story about a man who was blameless in his time, while the rest of the world was very, they had all the blame. They were not very righteous at all. And this Ark was huge. I mean, it was Noah, his three sons, and the rest of their family to, to build the ark. And it was so big, I've, I looked up some of the numbers, and some of the numbers say that it was as tall as a four-story building and as long as 11 and a half football fields. That is insane to think about. It was Noah and his family building that ark. Now, the whole rest of the world is so unrighteous. Can you imagine the comments that were being said the, the, his, about Noah's reputation that was being tarnished just because he was doing the will of God. I mean, he was, he was doing something before building the ark, before receiving the calling of that to build the ark. The unrighteous world was tarnishing his reputation just because he was doing the will of God. But here Noah is submitting his pride and his reputation as an act of worship to God giving everything he has, quitting everything that he was doing before in order to carry out the will of God. Let's look at this last one. In Mark chapter 12, we read about the widow who gave everything she had. So Jesus and his disciples were sitting in the temple. They were watching very rich people give a lot of money, a lot of money. And then they see this old woman, obviously very poor, comes in, throws in two coins and leaves. And Jesus said, do you see that woman? She gave even all her living, the Bible says, gave even all her living. And she gave more than those people gave. And if I was a disciple, I would be like, look at this big bag of coins and then look at these two coins. How is that possible, Jesus? And he said, they gave out of, her, out of their surplus. She gave even all her living. And some commentators believe that that means she gave so much money, she didn't even have money to eat. Isn't that crazy? That's worship, giving everything you are, everything you have. So these physical examples of worship can look many different ways, but what of all of these expressions of worship have in common? I think they show a total submission of physical self, a total submission of pride, and a total omission of selfishness. See, like I said earlier, worship, it's not attractive. Worship is surrender to the king. It's submission to the king. So going back to our illustration of the the river rock, our faith journey looks good when we're focusing on being shaped by God and worshiping God. But what does it look like if we're being shaped by something else? We're constantly being shaped by something. But what is it that's shaping us? Is it God or are we worshiping something else? And here's, here's one way that you can see what you're worshiping. Where are your time and your finances going? That, that can give you a little glimpse into what you're worshiping. Could it be vanity? Could you be worshiping what you look like? Could you be worshiping sports? I'm a huge fan of the Patriots, and I know people are probably groaning like, ugh. All right, Tom Brady's gone. We can, we can get rid of all the Patriot hate, Okay. Are we worshiping sports? Are we worshiping our kids' activities? Are we worshiping the love of money? 
Are we worshiping the weird obsession of just being busy and telling everybody we're busy? What is currently taking away the voice of God in your life? What has a hold over the voice of God in your life? Whatever it is, it's shaping you day by day. And if it isn't God that's shaping you, then it's not worth our worship. What are you currently worshiping? And what is currently shaping your life? Are you striving to worship God so that he can shape your life? Or are you striving to worship something else? And is that shaping your life? So once we identify what we're worshiping, if it isn't God, here's a few reasons as to why God deserves more worship than that thing. Number one, through God sending his son, I am free from bondage. I am free from my past. I'm free from hell. I'm going to have eternal life and I can boldly approach the throne. And that's a reason to worship God. I'm a better husband, father, son, friend, Pastor, Christian, a better everything because of what the Holy Spirit has done in my life. That's a reason to worship God. Look at your life. The blessings on blessings on blessings. Come on. That's a reason to worship God. I know he's given you blessings in your life. Because he's good and because he's holy. Now, those are just a few reasons as to why I worship God, and I'm sure you have your own. But God still deserves to be worshiped on our worst days. He still deserves to be worshiped on our worst days. Even what's going on in our life, God is still good. He just still deserves to be worshiped. So even if we don't like the song, even if we don't have a fog machine and a cool LED wall here, even if the worship pastor's pants are way too tight, I was expecting a little bit more chuckles out of that. I really do try to stay away from the stigma of of tight pants and worship pastors. Anyways, God still deserves to be worshiped. And our posture of worship is an outward expression of our inward hearts. If we say we love something but never express that love outwardly, how is anyone going to know? So if I go up to, to Courtney, my wife, and I say, hey, Courtney, I love you so much, but I never express that love outwardly toward her, how is she going to know? Guys, love elicits a response, an outward expression. So think of a friend or a family member right now. Does that friend or family member know that you love them? How would, how would they know that you love them? It's probably based on your outward expression towards them, your, your words or your actions towards them. Our words and our actions are an outward expression of an inward look into our heart, how we feel, how we love. So during our worship service, when we are singing out to God and we're standing there like this, is that an expression? Is that showing God how much we love him? Is that showing God that he deserves our worship? Absolutely not. The way that we worship during worship, during our worship service, is a look into our hearts, believe it or not. Let me just step off of the toes that I just stepped on right there. So what does our posture say about our love for God? Guys, did you know that it's, it's biblical to raise your hands during worship? Did you know that it's biblical to, to sing loud during worship? And here's a thought. God gave us vocal cords. and We've got to use them. He created us to lift our voice to him. And an excuse that I hear all the time is, well, I don't sing because I'm not a good singer. But I'm here to tell you this morning, that excuse has no weight anymore because when we worship God, good or not good, it is a joyful noise to him. We, we get that straight from God's word. It's a joyful noise. Remember, worship is a submission of pride. If we're more worried about what people think than giving God the worship he deserves, there's something wrong with that. There's something off. So here's here's how to not be worshipers, be wanderers. I was talking about the Israelites in the introduction of the sermon. And 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, like the kids say it today, they were down bad, right? They were feeling bad. Do you know why they were wandering for 40 years? It's because they weren't worshipers. So they became wanderers. 
They didn't love God with all they were. They didn't surrender to the journey of being shaped by God. They didn't love how long it took to be shaped. They just wanted to get to their destination. They were a little Evan in the car, just wanting to get to grandma's house. The trip is taking too long for them. So they turn to other gods. They turn to other idols, but they forgot about the promises of God. They weren't worshiping. They were wandering. And even though they were groaning and complaining, God still provided for them. God still provided food. He provided manna. He provided quail for them every day. And that's a sermon in itself. I mean, when we're here, when we're groaning and complaining, we're wandering more than we're worshiping, God still provides. So how many of us are are wanderers right now? How many of us are missing out on the promises of God because we aren't fully committed to becoming worshipers of God? We're just committed to becoming wanderers. So here's the main point, guys. Be a worshiper, not a wanderer. Be a worshiper. What What does it mean to be a worshiper? A worshiper loves God with all their heart, with all their soul, and with with all their mind. A worshiper loves God with everything they are. Well, what does that look like to, to love God with everything you are? A few examples. Giving up sleep to read the Bible. I know I've already said that one, but it's powerful. Getting up an hour early, submitting your time to just spend time with God and let him shape you. Serving your family by doing the dishes. If you don't have a dishwasher in your house, I feel your pain. I hate doing dishes. But that's, that's worship. Showing someone love instead of getting angry when they're driving like a maniac. That's worship. Giving up your will to fulfill God's will in your life. That's worship. Submitting in whatever fashion that God is speaking to you. That's worship. So here at New Song, we give you guys opportunities to become a worshiper. And the first one is serving on Sunday mornings. You know, we, we don't give you guys the opportunity to serve because we need to fill spots. We give you guys the opportunity to serve because it's essential to your relationship with God. It's essential. Submitting your time in order to, to serve, that's worship. Giving back the gifts that God has given you, That's worship. You know, some of the happiest people I know are servant-hearted people. One is my mom. One is my mother-in-law. Happy people. The second one is our worship service. So we don't sing these songs right before the sermon to get you guys warmed up to receive what God has given whoever is preaching that day. We give you guys the opportunity to sing because it's another chance to to praise God. It's another chance to worship our creator. It's another chance to bring God in just by our posture, just by us inviting him in. And so when I look around on on Sunday mornings and I'm leading worship and I see people just with dead faces and, and no hands raised, man, it breaks my heart because we're not getting it. We're missing the point. I mean, take a look at your life. You can see a reason to worship God. You can see a reason to lift your hands and sing the words that are on the screen. You can find the reasons. An outward expression of an inward look to our hearts. But guys, it's, it's not about who's leading from the stage. It's not about who's up here leading. Because if I'm not here, guess what? Worship still goes on. The worship service still happens. It's about who's sitting on the throne. It's not about who's leading from the stage. It's about who's sitting on the throne. And so do you guys want to know the greatest example of worship? The greatest example of what a worshiper should be? It's Jesus on the cross. Jesus had the choice to not be on the cross or to be on the cross. And he chose, knowing everything that was going to happen, to fulfill the will of God in his life. He loved his father so much with all of his heart, his soul, his mind, that he took the pain. He took the cross. He took the beating. He chose to. 
because he's a worshiper. And do you know how much stress that Jesus was under that day? It said that Jesus sweat literal blood. And it's a super rare condition, but it happens when a person is under so much mental and physical stress that the blood vessels that feed into the sweat glands, they burst. They're under so much stress. The choice of that put him under that much stress, but he still chose everything. He still chose to give everything. Man, that's a worshiper. Why did he choose that? Because he loves his father with all of his heart, soul, and mind. He chose to. Guys, this is real stuff. This is eternity we're talking about. Jesus really did die on the cross for every sin that we've all committed, every sin that we will commit. He died for it all. And guys, this morning, if if you haven't had the chance to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I'm gonna pray a prayer to give you that chance. And after that, I'm gonna pray a prayer to hopefully help us to be better worshipers of God. So let's everybody bow our heads and let's close our eyes. And if you want to accept Jesus as your savior this morning, then pray this prayer with me in your hearts. Jesus, I'm sorry for the way I've been living my life. I didn't know that there was another way. I didn't know that you are the way, but I do now. I ask you to come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior this morning. I ask you to forgive me for the sins I've committed. And I ask you to help me become a better worshiper like you. Jesus, take complete control of my life and guide me by your spirit. And finally, thank you for saving me and for what you did on the cross. In your name I pray, amen. And with every head still bowed, every, every eye still closed, if you, wanna, if you wanna make that known this morning that you prayed that prayer with nobody else looking around, because this isn't your moment, this is theirs, those who have raised their hands, I want you to make that known by raising your hand right now. Amen. Guys, we have some people who have raised their hands this morning and God deserves all the glory. Come on, let's give God some praise this morning. I want to let you know, those who have raised your hands, go look for this book at our guest services desk. It's called Fresh Start. It's a great book. And it's one you need along with the Bible. (laughs) Guys, this is the the best decision that you will ever make. And so let's pray real quick to become better worshipers of God. Let's bow our heads. Oh God, thank you so much for being here this morning. God, I pray that you give us the idea of what it means to be a worshiper of you. God, give us the idea of what it means to become a better worshiper just like Jesus. Give us ways that we can sacrifice in order to love you with all of our heart, soul, and mind. Give us ways that we can love other people to worship you better. God, help us to be a better worshiper and not a better wanderer. Help us to seek you with everything we are. God, we love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you so much for coming this morning. Let's give it up one more time for the people who have given their life to Christ. Amen. Church, this week, let's become better worshipers, not better wanderers. All right, we'll see you next week. We love you guys.